everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. David Dushman is a humanitarian photographer, an author, an artist, a podcast host, but most of all, he's a student of life. He teaches, travels, and writes about the creative process and shares his insights along the way. I am delighted to welcome David to the podcast today. David, welcome to Bump in the Road. Um, I'm really excited to have you on today. I'm a big fan and I have a number of your books, but I'd like to kind of start our conversation with how did you get into photography? Uh, well, first of all, Pat, it's uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. I um, I honestly, I, I mean, it, it's I think like anything in life, it's kind of this long, slow, zigzaggy evolution. I started. My father gave me a a little. Um, there was a film format called 110 and it had negatives about the size of your pinky finger, um, uh, the, the fingernail on your pinky finger. There was the image quality was terrible. And, um, and he gave me this, it was this little rectangle that I could carry around in my pocket. And I was probably 10 years old and there was just something about it that I loved. There were no options available. There were no settings. It was just a button. And I would, I mean, I spent my allowance on these terrible roles of awful film, but I was, I was just in love. I, I remember going camping with, it was always in my back pocket and it was never for me about photography. It wasn't even about the camera. It was about, eventually it was also about the photographs, but it was about having this excuse to go and look at how things looked through the viewfinder through it had two lenses it had a slightly telephoto lens and a slightly wide angle lens and those were your options but i loved it because both of them were different from the way i normally saw and so i would go off and i would have you know 24 exposures and i would i would just play and i would photograph whatever crazy thing i could find to photograph and it introduced me to a whole new world and eventually i found a a, you know a, a proper camera at a neighbor's garage sale and i i bought it and soon after that this same neighbor traded some babysitting services from me for all his old darkroom equipment and before you knew it i was sort of a photographer i kind of just one day woke up and went this is the thing that kind of lights me up inside and uh it's just been this growing sort of evolutionary journey ever since you're so lucky to find that kind of passion so early in life I don't know that it was passion. I it was it just was the only thing that kind of <laughs> made sense to me. You know, it's I don't remember ever feeling passionate so much as interested, curious. I just had this thing that made sense, you know, and while all my peers were off playing music and that didn't I mean, it appealed to me in a se- in this sort of abstract sense like, oh, that'd be so cool to be a musician, but I had no idea where one would even start, but the camera made sense to me and it was just kind of, and then I ended up, you know, taking band photographs and one thing led to another. And soon I was doing this, but I also recognized as it got to that point where, you know, I was leaving high school and I recognized that if I did it as a career at that point, it would kind of suck the fun out of it. And uh, so maybe that's where the passion ignited, you know, as an older um, teenager was having this thing that not only made sense to me, but that I just really enjoyed doing, or maybe, maybe I just really enjoyed having something that I was finally good at. Maybe that's, <laughs> that's, that was my passion was just something that I wasn't bad at was quite a revelation to me. <laughs> but you took a detour to comedy, didn't you, for a while? I did. I took a couple of detours. I, uh, I, I ran off to, to school, much to the horror of my mother. I ran off to school in the Canadian prairies uh, and did a theology, actually two theology degrees. Uh, she was quite convinced that I joined a cult. Um, <laughs> lo- looking back, I can see, I absolutely can see the, the cause for her concerns. Um, but it was, you know, during that time that I started performing for kids and juggling and doing magic tricks. And by the time I graduated from this, uh, these college d- degrees, I was putting myself through college with my comedy and uh, to the horror of, you know, these very serious uh, theology professors. I ran off and started a 12-year career in uh, 
in stand-up comedy, you know, telling telling fart jokes to eight-year-olds and uh, juggling, and you know, and eventually it became a, quite a successful um, twelve-year career in comedy. How do you think um, that exposure to comedy has influenced your photography? Oh, that's a good question. I I think for me, it's all about whatever the medium is. It's all about. Uh, or has become about the audience. And so when I was, you cannot be a comedian without being an, having an awareness and an empathy for your audience and understanding that telling a joke one way, uh, it'll fall flat. Telling a joke with just a slight tweak to the rhythm or the order of your words, and it's the funniest thing you've ever said. And And it's just, it's a small change, but it's that you come across that change or you're inspired to make that change, not because it just occurs to you necessarily, but because you know that the audience might respond one way to one order of words and rhythm and, and completely differently to a, a very slight adjustment. And I think I see my photography that way as well. You know, it begins with, for me, an understanding of how will other people experience this photograph? How will they see it? What will they think? What will they uh, not whether they like it or not, but what will they experience from it? Will they feel like they're part of it? Will they feel the depth of the photograph? Will they feel the emotion or the energy in the photograph? And to me, that has, I think, been the great gift of 12 years in comedy is a, a pretty relentless desire uh, to make that experience as strong as possible. You know, uh, comedians are are uh, despite being comedians, they're a very serious bunch and they are relentless. The best of them are relentless at editing anything out that is not essential uh, from their routine, from even just from one line. And uh, I think I've carried that over into my photography to want the very strongest of those experiences and to, to make every little change that I can to really put heart and soul into it, not just to make it a sharp photograph or one that has, you know, pretty colors, but make it something that's uh, more, um, that's a deeper human experience than merely just a, a visual, uh, hey, that's a nice photograph. Uh, how do you balance that very internal creative process with the desire to evoke emotion from others? Um. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I balance it. I think I, I keep it in tension maybe, or one is uh, just the, one is the path to the other. I'm not really sure. I mean, my, I, I'm very introverted, but my creative life has never been one of sort of being locked away and creating for creative uh, creativity's sake. It is always I have always had an audience. I've, I've always written for an audience. I've always performed for an audience. And on some level, I've always photographed for an audience. When I started professionally doing photography, it was as a humanitarian photographer. And it was very important that I not just make whatever photograph I wanted, but that in doing so, I also uh, engaged my empathy and tried to engage the empathy of my the audience that would look at these photographs and see images of hope and see images of struggle and triumph and, and those sorts. So there was always a story to tell. And if you're going to tell a story, you, should, you, you better have someone who's listening. So it's always been connected in the sense that the creative process is, it's deeply internal, it's deeply personal, but it's also just really, it's not muses and magic. It's, it's practical. Just, you just use the tools you've learned to use and figure out how to say the things you can with the greatest amount of empathy for the audience, the audience that's going to be listening and hearing and, and hopefully you just don't get too much in your own way. You know, um, uh, I'm a beginner photographer mm -hmm. and I find the, the task of telling a story through photography is far more difficult than people think to really have a photograph that tells a good story. Um, I, it, it's something I, I have yet to achieve and your photographs tell us tell such strong stories. I mean, they're really impactful. Thank you. I, you know, I, I don't think it's as, uh, I don't think it's as hard as, uh, as you, you make it sound. It, it, the thing is, it's a separate craft entirely. And very often photographers, in fact, a lot of people talk about the value of story and telling a story. But if you sat that person down who has just said, it's so important that your pictures tell a story, and you said, tell me about the elements of story. Tell me what makes a good story. 
uh, they would kind of look at you all, you know, all funny and, and uh, <laughs> you know, kind of walk away as quickly as they could because m- m- it's an entirely separate craft of its own. And you need to understand the elements of story. And I've been studying story for years. I mean, like every other person human being on this planet. At some point I had aspirations of, of, uh, you know, writing the, the great Canadian screenplay or something. And, um, but my background in comedy tells me if you want to be good at comedy, you've got to study comedy. You've got to study why people laugh at certain things and not at others, how to develop a well-paced, well written routine. And so I started studying screenwriting and I studied story structure and I studied what makes a story compelling and what sort of uh, helps a story fall apart before it's even born. So I bring that very intentional learning about story uh, to my photographs. And I think anyone can do that. It's just, you've got to, you've, you've got to sort of understand that the elements of that whole separate craft and figure out how to, uh, how to introduce them in a different setting like photography. That, that's really interesting to me. Um, I'm studying with um, Christy Odom, um, who's a photographer, and one of the things she has me doing is journaling and starting to create a story before I even go out and shoot a picture. And it's a game changer in terms mm-hmm. of how you look at things. Mm-hmm. And and story too. I mean, I I, I, I just this conversation. The your podcast is about story, right? The essence of every story is that bump in the road. There's no story without conflict. There's no story without struggle and, and the, uh, you know, the longing to overcome something in pursuit of something else. And if, if there is no, if there's not that conflict or that contrast, which is so, I mean, I mean, what human life doesn't have that. Right. Uh, But the more we look at those things and accept those things, the more we begin to understand story and whether you're a photographer or a painter or a writer, it's all this, it's all the same thing or a podcaster, you know, speaking of podcasts, I love your podcast, a a beautiful anarchy. Where does the title come from? Uh, It came from a blog post at, at some point I was, you know, I'm somewhat prone to rants about (laughs) certain things. And uh, someone had talked about, you know, the rules and you got to follow the rules, but you know, before you, you, uh, before you break them, you've got to learn the rules. And I, and I kind of came back at it and said, well, you know, not to be, not to be an iconoclast or to, to stir up trouble, but I'm going to, so <laughs> I said, you know, I don't be- even believe that there are any rules. I don't think you have to learn. You have to learn principles. You have to learn your craft. Absolutely. But um, I just don't think when it comes to art and the creative life, I don't think there are any rules at all. It is just this beautiful anarchy. And I sort of, I wrote it and later on I thought, hmm, you know, I really, I like that because the idea of anarchy separate from the political implications and burning tires in the streets and that sort of thing, <laughs> the, the idea of anarchy is that you answer to yourself that you don't have, you don't subscribe to some ruler that says, do this, don't do that. You know, you're not an actor on a stage with a script that you have to carefully perform, it's more like improv. And it just became a metaphor to me for the creative life and an acknowledgement that it's my responsibility to live my life, not someone else's to dictate it to me. And so I kind of, it was a moment of my own understanding that um, I had maybe been abdicating some of the uh, decisions in my own life um, and that it was all up to me. If I was going to, at the end of this whole thing, look back and say, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> to, to steal from Frank Sinatra, I did it my way and not in a selfish, being a jerk kind of fashion, but just authentic to myself. It just did it in the way, lived my life, lived my story, the way that I felt was most authentic to me. And, and so I kind of, it stuck as a metaphor and I tend to see the world through metaphor. Yeah, I like metaphor. I like a lot of the Buddhist quotes. Um, And I totally agree with you that you have a responsibility to live your life um, in a way that is in tune with your your own soul. Um, And every now and then we all hit these bumps in the road. um, And how we respond to them, I think, is everything. Now, in 2011 in Pisa, you took a terrible fall, didn't you? Yeah, (laughs) it wasn't one of my best ideas ever, Pat. (laughs) I, I... I was angling for uh, 
Uh, well, to, for some context, uh, the the River Arno flows almost through the heart of the city um, in in Tuscany, and uh, on it's flanked by these sort of thirty foot walls, and street level is at the top. So it wasn't that I was foolishly climbing a thirty foot wall. Um, I was already on top of it, and it was Easter Sunday or Easter weekend, and we were sitting around and I was at the top and I, it was, you know, we'd had dinner and it was a lovely evening. And I sort of looked over and I thought, you know, this would be a better photograph if I could just get a little lower. And when I looked down, there was a, a ledge, maybe four feet on the other side of this wall. I thought, well, I'll just hop down and stand on this ledge and see if I can get a photograph. And uh, I hopped down and I don't really remember exactly what happened next, but I do remember that I just kept going. And I thought, I, I mean, just the, you don't have that much time to think. And all I thought was, I'm not going to make it. Like, it was just this this surreal moment of, oh, my gosh, this is it. Like, I, this is, it was a long way down. And, um, yeah, it, uh, it changed everything for me. It was this moment, I think that's the moment I grew up when I suddenly realized that uh, this was, I've always been you know, preaching this life is short message, but I think I really understood it experientially <laughs> in, in that moment when I thought, you know what, this is, this is it. And uh, th thankfully, you know, I think had it been it, um, it would have happened so fast, I wouldn't have had more, you know, even the time to get scared of it. But when I realized it was in fact not it, and I kind of, you know, I, I landed on my feet, crumpled into a ball and, um, you know, kind of assessed myself. And eventually somebody uh, with my group saw me and, you know, called down and said, are you okay? And I sort of, I had no breath and I sort of said, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and eventually they brought, they got an ambulance and it, there was no way down really, except for some very distant steps a staircase coming down. So eventually, you know, they had this big crane come up with the, the EMTs and they, they bundled me up and lifted me out. And of course this was good Friday in, in Pisa, there was nothing else to do at 11 o'clock in the evening. So the whole city was watching this stupid <laughs> tourist that had, you know, jumped <laughs> off the wall. And, you know, it turns out that, uh, this is not an uncommon occurrence. Although I think most people that fall off that wall are probably drunk and fall backwards and tumble off. And so of the four people, this was what May, April, May of, uh, 2011 of the four people, I myself being the fourth that had fallen off that year already, I was the only one that lived. And that was a very sobering realization that, you know, one out of one out of four, I, I was the guy that, that, was still alive, despite the fact that I shattered my feet and cracked my pelvis and was in for a sort of a, a world of change. It was uh, it was sobering in the best possible way. You know, in in the years since, I've had a lot of pain and I've had to learn to walk again and I've had multiple surgeries and but through it all, I've always maintained that gratitude is hands down the best painkiller. You know, there are times when it just, it's frustrating, it hurts. And I come back to this idea of, I, I'm the guy that didn't, you know, end, end his life. I'm the guy that made it. And it's incredibly uh, gratifying, you know, and you could, I could be frustrated or bitter or angry that, you know, this had happened to me, but you know, I mean, in, in part, I, I do take responsibility for the fact that I was the one that, you know, kind of initiated this catastrophe. Um, but as you said earlier, it's our reactions to life. We don't get to control anything. Change is a constant and uh, everything is impermanent. But our reactions to things are everything. You know, they determine whether you're happy or angry. They determine whether you're positive or negative and it's our choice. You know, I, my mother recently said, I mentioned that, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned that, uh, you know, it was the longest day of the year, uh, a couple days ago. And she said, yeah, she's, you know, she's really upset about that because it means the days are getting shorter. And I sort of, you know, I love my mother and this is not a, a commentary on her, but it reminded me that that even that is our choice. You can either look at it as a negative thing or not, but your experience, we control that. We control whether we're, whether we choose to be happy about something or whether we choose to 
be angry or to not forgive or any of the this bundle of very real but also negative human emotions that affect our experience. And I choose gratitude. I choose every day to wake up and go, you know what? I get one, I get a, a day that I would almost didn't have. Yeah, I, I'm right with I'm right there with you with gratitude. I wake up every morning, I find five things to be grateful for. They have to be different every day. And then I meditate. And that's how I start my day. And I think it sets a positive tone. And I I, I totally agree with you that it's up to us to decide how we handle um the things that life throws at us. Mm-hmm. With, with with your accident, did it change your work trajectory and did it change what you found compelling or interesting in any way? I think it made everything more urgent. You know, we we struggle in no matter what you do, we all struggle in this tension between what is uh, you know, what is truly urgent and truly important. Um, and I things just became really really urgent for me um, in the sense that I recognize that this kind of thing might happen again. You know, that there's this very fine thread between you're alive and then you're not. And that ever no day is guaranteed to us. And, you know, with these kind of conversations, we're always in danger of slipping into, you know, the, the cliche. But the reality is that this is, it's true, you know, that Today is a gift, and it's why we call it the present. You know, as cliche as that is, as much as, makes, as much as it makes me want to roll my eyes, the reality is you can live like that, or you can choose to continue to live with this blindfold on that says, "I've got as much. I've got all the time in the world." We don't have all the time in the world. It doesn't mean we need to rush. I live in no particular great hurry, but I get stuff done, knowing that the only day that is guaranteed to me is today. So. It kind of ramped that up, and with that, the that's the urgency. But the, also the important stuff became much more clear. You know, the the idea that uh, we have only so much time to accomplish the things we do. It made me realize that there are some things that I really need to get going on, and um, within the constraints that I have. Suddenly, my career as a humanitarian photographer was uh, a little less guaranteed to me uh, because I couldn't just, you know, get up and walk, for example. Um, It took me a long time even just to learn to walk again. And now even still, I I struggle with mobility issues. My ankles get worse with every day and not better. Um, So yeah, it changed very much. It changed my trajectory, not both in terms of what I could do, but also in terms of what I really longed to do. And so because I couldn't do the kind of humanitarian photography that I had been doing with as much. Um, yeah, I was going, I was out all the time. I was traveling three quarters of the year and, and I was doing really long, hard work, carrying a lot of heavy gear and I couldn't do that anymore. And so I redirected my efforts to, you know, in my desire to, to change the world and make the world a better place. And I ramped up my writing efforts and, um, yeah, change, change things dramatically. Uh, I think I could have laid there and been very uh, upset about what was no longer possible, but that's one of those things you can do nothing about. So I chose to focus on, and I didn't do this because I'm a particularly enlightened human being. I just realized that I had two choices and one didn't result in anything. And one was the choice to get better and do the things that I could do and just, you know, return to some kind of work. I've been self-employed since I was you know, out of college. So I didn't really have a lot of choice. I just had to find the new thing um, that would allow me to continue to not just have the life I wanted to, but I also make a living. Now, one of one of my favorite podcasts of yours is Navigating Fog. Mm-hmm. And you talk about how we, we all live in the fog to some extent. We don't know if tomorrow will happen or if it happens, what it will hold. But mm-hmm. you make the point that getting moving is so important. It's it's really important. In fact, I just uh, probably within three three weeks will publish a new book called Start Ugly, and the whole idea is you got to start. You know, it's we get so paralyzed by getting moving on things. There's always a reason. You know, I don't have it quite figured out, and it, it's my first efforts aren't going to be perfect, and we get we get really quite paralyzed. And the single most important thing is just that you start and start often, but also just be really willing to start ugly because it's not, you don't get everything figured out and then do. In doing, 
you figure things out. In doing, you find new corners to peek around and discover new things and you try something and it doesn't quite work the way you thought, but it, <laughs> if you're willing to learn from it, it gives you new keys for the next step that you take. And so that, that you know, uh, the, the, the poet Goethe said, that beginning, you know, the, the, that's where the magic is. And I'm right there with them. You know, we do not, uh, we are all in the fog. I mean, we like to think we have everything planned out, but if COVID has taught us anything, we don't know what's around the corner. I'm not all of a sudden, those of us that were chronic planners that had everything planned out two years in advance are going, well, now what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like suddenly we've realized, actually, we were in the fog all along. We just had a really good planner that we were you know, writing our ideas in. Now the planner just be, seems to become completely irrelevant. So now we don't have any choice except to acknowledge the fog and go, all right, you know what? What I have is today and I'm going to start whatever it is. I don't know what's coming tomorrow but I'm going to start it today because if you don't, it just never happens. It just, we, we eventually get to the end of the life that we lived and we go, man, I always wish I'd learned guitar. I always wish I'd learned French. I always wish I'd written my book. Well, the time to do it is now, you know, and, and as uh, you know, I, I'm not even sure if the Buddha gets quote, credit for the quote, but the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. The second best time is today. That's what we've, <laughs> that's what we've got. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think um, it takes some courage to start ugly, but really anything that any of us do starts off pretty ugly. It does. We we start ugly. I mean, with no disrespect to all the babies about to be born into the world <laughs> and the mothers that, you know, that look at that that brand new face and say, oh my God, he's so beautiful. Uh, really? I mean, we start kind of, the beauty is to be found in the potential and the fact that it's your child. But when they first, <laughs> they start ugly. I will go to the mats on this one. <laughs> yeah, But we don't discard it. We don't go, oh, that's a that's an ugly human being. We know that in a couple of years, maybe even a couple of weeks, that child is going to look completely different. And, and yes, you start ugly, but every day, every step in the, the journey is uh, an effort in refinement. We don't finish ugly. Well, some, some people do. I mean, but we make our choices, right? You have the option every day to refine that thing and to discover new things about yourself and new blind spots that you can, uh, you know, that you can peer into. And we have this incredible possibility in our lives to allow evolution and mutation and mistakes and all of that human mess to guide us to better choices and to become a uh, softer, kinder, more creative, whatever it is you want from your life. We have that possibility, but it almost never starts that way. It almost always starts with this. You know, you kind of look at it and go, really? This, these <laughs> are the cards I've got to play with? The, the, they get better. They, they really do get better. But again, that's, that's a choice. And many people get so paralyzed by the initial ugliness, or let's put it a different way, the initial lack of evidence that it will be anything but ugly and we get discouraged and we go ah yeah but you know it's it didn't work the first time so why keep trying well that's exactly why to keep trying because it never works the first time it's always better the second or the third time you try it because you you learn these lessons and you become a different person a masterpiece isn't you don't become a master by creating a masterpiece you create a masterpiece only after you've become a master. And that takes a lifetime of making things that are not masterpieces. If you could rewrite your story, would you? No, absolutely not. I, I have, um, uh, there, there are things that are in my, in the current chapter that I look at and go, you know, that was a really crappy thing for the author to put in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but our stories are contingent again, not on the conflict that is within them, not on that particular struggle, but on what the characters choose to do to them. And of course, so much is of is out of our control. But no, I the person I am now. You can't really play the what if game, but the person that I am now is a, a direct result of the things that happened to me that allowed me choices to respond in this way and that way. And I mean, I've gone through I've gone through more than my fair share as far as I'm concerned, you know, I've been, uh, and a lot of this is stuff I, I have that has been done to me, uh, but as much is are things that, you know, I have done and done to others. But, you know, I, I mean, I was diagnosed with, with type one diabetes when I was just out of, um, 
being a teenager. Um, I've gone bankrupt. I've been twice divorced. I'm, you know, I've had this accident. I've, I've had a lot of things happen to me um, that you could look back and go, well, you know, if, if you could change that, would you? Well, it was painful at the time, but it's over now. And most significantly, it has made me the person that I've become. So I can't even imagine what it would mean, you know, to go back in time and undo that, that one thing or make a different choice because it would result in a completely, I might be a completely miserable person <laughs> had, had all of those things not happened. I might not be the person that embraces gratitude the way that I do now. I might not value wonder and the unexpected the way that I do now. So no, I, I, I'm intrigued by, I'm much more interested in where the story is going than where the story has, has come from. Oh, that's a great way to put it. I like that. Thank you. What advice do you have for anybody facing a bump in the road? Oh, well, first of all, it, it, I mean, I often, I have a tendency to make things very positive sounding. And the first thing I would say is you've got to acknowledge what you're feeling about it. You know, you've got to, nobody skips the stages of grief. Nobody gets to just, you know, uh, jump to the front of the line. We all experience, you know, the anger and the doubts and all of that human you know, stuff. So you've got to experience it. The other thing I would say is don't, you don't have, it's not something to be figured out. A friend of mine had a, had his father die around the same time that my father died uh, about 18 months ago. And we were talking about this and he says, you know, I just still haven't, I guess I still need time to process it. And I said, you know what? I said, I hear exactly what you're saying. But I don't think the death of your father is something you process. I think it's something that you need to experience. And uh, uh, to process it kind of, it makes it sound like I just got to figure it out. You know, I just got to get to the end of my mental process and tidy it up in a bow. And I don't think that happens. I think the, the, the absence of my father will be a presence for the rest of my life. And I think you don't put it in a tidy little compartment. You just have to grieve. You have to experience it. And then make choices as that pain gets a little bit less sharp. You make choices about how you move forward. You know, what do you do with that? What do you do with those memories? And do you choose to hang on to old resentments? And do you choose to forgive and move forward and take the best of what my father, and we had a very complicated relationship, but do, or do you let it kind of hamstring you. You know, I, I think there's a reason why we talk about things like forgiveness and it's not just for other people. In fact, it's often not at all for other people. It's, it's freeing for us. And so for those that are at the bump in the road, I think there's great comfort in the fact that everything changes. It has just changed uh, in a way that's not particularly comfortable now, but that state is also impermanent. You know, it will become uh, a different thing. And it's an opportunity to experience greater joy, greater discovery. And again, I don't want to make it sound uh, like you just choose to be happy. And because there is no way to be happy when uh, an unexpected diagnosis comes or when you get that unexpected phone call. But there is a way to be human in it and to respond to it uh, with time, with gratitude, and to see where the story is heading potentially and to engage it. Cause all we have ultimately in this life pad is the experience of being alive. And if I knew that I was going to die in a week, I wouldn't spend that week moaning about the fact that I only had a week to live. I would spend it living. And uh, if I have to take a day to figure that out um, and, and kind of, experience that as best I can, that grieving cycle, the sooner I can get over that and embrace it and move forward into gratitude and whatever it is that I need to fill my days with and experience over the next six days now, um, that's the thing that I would urge people to focus on is where is this going? Because focusing on that, which you cannot change, you may as well just bang your head against the wall. It only increases the pain. 
I couldn't um, I couldn't say that any better. Um, David, thank you. This has been just a, a terrific conversation. I so appreciate your time. And um, I will look forward to your future photographic classes. What thank what, you. Are, what are you planning um, once we're beyond this COVID-19? Um, well, I'm actually not planning anything beyond COVID. I'm just planning day to day because who knows how long this is going to last. If we wait until COVID's over, um, we just don't know. So I'm sort of approaching it day by day. Uh, you mentioned storytelling. I actually have a class on photographic storytelling that's coming out. Uh, I have, I've been working hard. I'm releasing two new books. I alluded to one. It's called Start Ugly, The Unexpected Path to Creative, Everyday Creativity. Um, the other is actually a written uh, compilation of my podcast episodes uh, called The Problem with Muses. Um, a lot of my audience would actually rather read my words than uh, have to listen to my voice. So I've put that into a, a volume that I'm releasing next month as well at the same time as Start Ugly. Uh, and I've got yet another course coming out called Image Work. So Image Work and Image Story will go together. And I just, you know, I want to while people have got the time to learn and to process these things, I want to continue to be the, be a helpful voice in whatever way I can. And, you know, I love my days. I start off with that cup of coffee and I write and I, I sit down and say, you know, what can I do that's helpful today? What can I do that would, you know, make someone, there's this wonderful roomy poem that essentially, and I, I should memorize this because <laughs> I've got it in the front of all my notebooks, but essentially it says, you know, be a light, a, a ladder and a lifeboat. And the idea is, you know, if you can find someone that that is in the darkness, be a light to them. If you find someone that's in a hole, be a ladder to them. And if you find someone that's up to their neck in water, be a, a lifeboat. And if you can do that, if you can use your creative life to do that, you will never lack for an audience. You'll never lack for people to, you know, to serve and, and you can build a business on that and you can build a life on that. So, that's my that's my COVID plan, and uh, we'll see. You know, we'll see what happens beyond that. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.